This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to Minnesota, where the state legislature's Democratic supermajority and Democratic Governor Tim Walz just enacted sweeping progressive reforms during its legislative session, which lasted only four months. The series of bills is being praised as the Minnesota Miracle 2.0, as Democrats successfully codified abortion rights, protections for transgender people, driver's licenses for undocumented residents, new gun control rules, paid family, medical and sick leave, the restoration of voting rights for previously incarcerated people. A $1 billion investment in affordable housing that includes rent assistance and stronger protections for workers seeking to unionize, among other reforms. The original Minnesota miracle was a nickname given to reforms enacted in the early 70s by a less conservative Republican legislature and then Democratic Governor Wendell Anderson. For more, we go to St. Paul, Minnesota, where we're joined by Peter Callahan, staff writer at the Men Post, who's covered all of this closely. Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Why don't you lay out what happened? How much time do you have? <laughs> you know, a, a lot happened. I mean, it, to us, and looking at this, uh, it's less of a surprise than it is for you, for you folks nationally, because the Democratic majorities were pretty clear early on uh, that they were going to uh, run most of these bills. There was some pent-up demand, actually a lot of pent-up demand. It's been 10 years of divided government in Minnesota, so neither party really got all that they wanted or even much that they wanted. So a, a somewhat surprising election uh, last November delivered narrow majorities for Democrats, but it was uh, a different kind of majority than they'd had 10 years ago in that it was also an ideological majority, not just a partisan majority. So it was one of the really few uh, pro-choice majorities that there had been in Minnesota. Um, even when Democrats had control in past sessions, they weren't uh, ab abortion rights majorities. So they they pretty much decided a couple of things. One, they had four years, meaning they could lose the House in two years, but they couldn't lose the governor's office or the state Senate until 26. So whatever they passed could stay in place for these four years. Uh, it's harder to uh, harder to rescind things than it is to pass things. And that they were going to make a list and check it off as they went. And so it was kind of less of a surprise to us here that all these things passed, and I think it was nationally. And could you talk specifically about the housing legislation, the nonprofit organization Homeline has described the tenant landlord law as the, the most substantial change in the state's history? Yeah, I, I'll give them a pass on how they know uh, what the landlord-tenant laws were like uh, at statehood. Um, but that sort of uh, hyperbole is pretty common now uh, as you go through. The, the landlord-tenant uh, changes are, again, a, a result of pent-up demand. Uh, for all these years, anything that passed in that realm had to be a compromise between landlords and tenant organizations. And with the trifecta, uh, a democratic trifecta, they no longer really needed to bring in the landlord groups. And a lot of these issues were things that had passed in other states and had been proposed by Democrats in Minnesota in the last uh, decade, but just didn't have the votes to pass. So that uh, landlord-tenant uh, changes were significant, but you, you really can't look at those without looking at the billion-dollar investment in affordable housing. Uh, a, a typical uh, budget for housing in Minnesota is 150 million to 200 million in a biennium. Uh, so that gives you some sense of what a billion dollars is. And that money isn't just going to build housing uh, with both public housing and with nonprofits. It's the first ever state voucher, rental voucher system, similar to the Section 8 program on the federal level. Uh, it's uh, uh, first time home buyers down payment assistance. Uh, it is uh, uh, a renewal of rental assistance similar to what went on during the pandemic across the country. Uh, that, that money is also significant and coupled with the tenant uh, rights uh, uh, bill is interesting because the landlord groups after the session were not happy with the uh, changes to landlord-tenant law, but they're pretty happy about the billion-dollar investment because their, their members will see that uh, through rent payments and other things. And uh, what are the potential for legal challenges to some of the uh, this legislation? Uh, 
I don't know that there's really anything that was thought to be outside the realm of the authority of the legislature. Um, the the uh, bills sort of have all, all been all been vetted over the last several years. I'm not aware of anything significant challenging, uh, similar to several years ago when they passed the opioids uh, protections. Uh, the uh, pharma definitely was going to sue and did sue, and that case is still pending, but I don't know of any litigation right now. Mm. Uh, Peter Callahan, we were just talking to New York folks about their fight right now to get health care for uh, all New Yorkers, uh, including undocumented New Yorkers. In fact, Min Minnesota did just that. Is that right? Can you talk about health care for all there and also the issue of abortion, what was passed? Yeah, it's uh, that that in fact I was listening to that segment and thinking that passed here uh, really with a, not a lot of attention on it. Um, Minnesota does uh, a system. I work the Washington legislature, so I know some contrast. Um, the, a lot of things show up in omnibus bills at the end of session. So ten big fat hundreds and hundreds of page bills, and things can get put into that those bills that maybe were heard, maybe were talked about, but but there there was no. Uh, obvious sense that they were passing. And things like uh, uh, health care under the Minnesota Care Program uh, for people who do not have documentation was put into one of those bills, so really didn't get a lot of attention. What we do after session is we start going through all of these bills to find all the things that were put into those bills. They don't make the list that we wrote about uh, on adjournment, but there's some there's significant things, and that was one of them. And the abortion rights issue, that was really, I, mean, I think it's, I'm comfortable in saying that these were abortion rights majorities. Uh, the the Dem Democrats didn't think they were going to win the majorities in either the House or the Senate. Uh, they thought the Senate Republicans would retain control, and the, the House DFL, I think, thought they were going to lose control of the legislature in November. I want to bring into the conversation <laughs> Robin Wansley, uh, Minneapolis's first black Democratic Socialist City Council member, longtime Minneapolis organizer and activist. Uh, the Minnesota governor, Tim Walls, faced backlash from labor organizers after, in May, he issued the first veto in his entire tenure, blocking a bill that would have granted minimum wage and better working protections for Uber and Lyft drivers. The veto came just hours after Uber threatened to pull out of Minnesota. Your response, Robin? Um, yeah, I think, you know, as Peter highlighted, what we saw at the state level um, and what was very crucial in delivering this Minnesota Miracle 2.0 is we saw finally the a coalition, a strong coalition be built between um, progressive and democratic socialist uh, elected officials, along with, uh, you know, key grassroots groups who have been organizing for decades around some of the key demands that you mentioned, um, as well as labor. Labor was part of that coalition, too. Um, and as part of that coalition, you know, we saw some amazing, you know, pieces of legislation be delivered. Um, but we also should, you know, see this veto as um, a clear indicator that corporate interests still hold significant sway and influence over um, our, our state government and over a contingency of the Democratic Party, specifically the establishment wing of the Democratic Party. Um, and that was manifested, yes, in the veto uh, against the uh, ride share protection um, legislation that would uplift uh, workers who are doing, you know, necessary uh, work with Uber and Lyft. Um, but we also saw it with the nurses staffing legislation, too, where Mayo Clinic threatened to pull out billions of dollars of investment because nurses dare to say that we actually need to center the needs of our healthcare workers and our patients as opposed to the profits of corporate healthcare executives. Um, so those were the two instances where, in light of this entire session, um, we saw still uh, the, the, uh, the establishment wing of the Democratic Party uh, be pulled to fulfill the interests of uh, the corporate esta establishment in this state. Um, and, you know, in light of that, I'm very excited, though, that my my office is working with those drivers who push for such an unprecedented part of, you know, of legislation that will uplift this segment of workers. We're on the work right now or on the ground right now in Minneapolis to get that done here um, and to, you know, support our colleagues as they bring that fight forward once again um, at the state 
coming um, into the 2024 legislative session. I also want to comment that uh, to, um, that uh, Peter kept referring to DFL, which for a global audience is the Minnesota Democratic Farmer Labor Party, the Minnesota affiliate of the U.S. Democratic Party.